All right, everybody, we're wrapping up day two of AWS Reinforce 2022. This is theCUBE, my name is Dave Vellante, and one of the folks that we featured, one of the, the, the companies that we featured on the AWS Startup Showcase Season 2, Episode 4, was Illumio, and of course they're here at the security theme event. PJ Kerner is CTO and co-founder of Illumio. Great to see you, welcome back to theCUBE. Yep, thanks for having me. Yeah, so, you know, I always like to ask co-founders, people with co-founder in their titles, like, go back to why you started the company. Let's go back to 2013. Why'd you start the company? Absolutely, because uh, back in 2013, it, one of the things that we sort of saw as technology transit, it was mostly AWS, was there were really three things. One was dynamic workloads. People were built putting workloads into production faster and faster. You talk about auto scale groups, and now you talk about containers. Like things were getting faster and faster in terms of compute. Second thing was applications were getting more connected, right? Um, you know, you, you, the Netflix architecture is one kind of extreme example of hyper connectivity, but applications were, were, were you know, what do you call it, the API economy or whatever, they were getting more connected. And the third problem back in 2013 was the problems around lateral movement. And at that point, it was more around nation state actors and, and you know, APTs that were in those environments. Um, for a lot of those, a lot of those customers. So, so those three trends were kind of, what do we need to do in security differently? And that's how Illumio started. So, okay, you say nation state. That's obviously changed, uh, and the uh, the ROI of, of of for hackers has become you know, pr pretty good. Um, and I guess your job is to make, reduce the ROI. But but so, what's the relationship, PJ, between? the API economy that you talked about in that lateral movement, are they kind of go hand in hand? They do, I think one, th one thing that we have as a mission is, and, and I, think it's, I think it's really important to understand is to prevent breaches from becoming cyber disasters, right? And, and I use this metaphor around kind of the submarine, and if you think about how submarines are built, it's submarines are built with watertight compartments inside the submarine, so when there is a physical breach, Right, what happens? So you get a torpedo or whatever, and it comes through the hull. You close off that compartment. There are redundant systems in place, but you close off that compartment. That one small thing you've lost, but the whole ship hasn't gone, gone down, and you sort of have, have survived that. That's, that's physical kind of resiliency, and that, those same kind of techniques in terms of segmentation, compartmentalization inside your environments is what makes good cyber resiliency. So prevent it from becoming a disaster. Okay, so, so you bring that micro-segmentation analogy, the, the submarine analogy with micro-segmentation to logical security, correct? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Okay, and, and okay, so uh, that was your idea in 2013. Now we fast forward to 2022. It's no longer just nation states. Um, things like ransomware are top of mind. Uh, I mean, everybody's like worried about what happened with solar winds and log4j and, and on and on and on. So what's What's the state of, what's the mindset of the CISO today? Yeah, I think, I think you, you said it right. So ransomware, because it's, if you th think about the, you know, the CIA triangle, you know, confidentiality, integrity, availability, what does ransomware really do, it does? It really attacks the availability problem, right? If you lock up all your laptops and can't actually, actually do business anymore, you have an availability problem, right? They might not have stole your data, but you know, they locked it up, but you can't do business. Maybe you restore from backups. So that availability problem has, has made it more, more visible to CEOs and board level like uh, you know, people, and they've been talking about ransomware as a problem. And so that has given the CISO either more dollars, more authority to sort of you know, attack that problem. And, and lateral movement is the primary way that you know, ransomware gets around and becomes a disaster, as opposed to just locking up one machine when you lock up your entire environment, and those are some of the fear around Colonial Pipeline came in, um, th that's when the disaster comes into play, and you want to be avoiding that. Describe in more detail what you mean by lateral movement. I think it's implied, but you're, you're, you enter in, into a point, and then instead of going, you're saying necessarily directly for the asset that you're going after, you're traversing the network, you're traversing other assets. Maybe you could describe that. Yeah, I mean, so, so often what happens is there's an initial point of breach, like someone has a password or somebody clicked on a, you know, a phishing link or something, and you have compromise into that, that environment, right? And then you might be compromised into a low-level 
uh, you know, a low-level place that doesn't have a you know, lot of data or is not worthwhile. Then you have to get from that place to data that is actually valuable, and that's where lateral movement comes into place. But also, I mean, you bring up a good point, it's like lateral movement prevention tools. Like, one way we've, we've done some research around, if you, like, segmentation is, imagine putting up a maze inside your data center or cloud, right? So that, like, how the attacker has to get from that initial breach to the crown jewels takes a lot longer when you have you know, a segmented environment, as opposed to if you have a very flat network, it, just, it is just go from there to go you know, find, that, find that asset. And hence, you just, you just increase the denominator in, in the ROI equation, and that just lowers the value for the hacker, they go, they go elsewhere. It's a, it's a, it's a, it is an economic, it, you're right, it's all about economics, it's a time to target, is what, what some of our research, like, so if, you, if, if you're a quick time to target, you're much you know, easier to sort of get that value uh, for the hacker. If it's a long time, they're going to get frustrated, they're going to stop, it might not be economically viable. You'll go, it's, it's, it's like the, you only have to run, you know, you only have to run faster than the, yeah, the, the, yeah, the, the two people with, yeah. the, with the bear chasing you, right? <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's talk about zero trust. So it's a topic that, you know, prior to the pandemic, I think a lot of people thought it was a buzzword. I, I have said actually it's become a mandate. Um, Having said that, others, I mean AWS in particular, kind of roll their eyes and say, ah, you know, we've always been zero trust. They were sort of forced into the, to the discussion. What's your point of view on, on zero trust? Is it a buzzword? Does it have meaning? What is that meaning to Illumio? Well, for me, for me there's actually two, there's two really important concepts. I mean, zero trust is a security philosophy. And so one is the idea of least privilege. And that's not a new idea. So when, you know, when AWS says they've done it, like they, they have embraced least privilege. There's a lot of good systems that have been built from scratch do, um, but not everybody has least privilege kind of controls everywhere. Secondly, least privilege is not about a one-time thing. It is about a continuously monitoring, you know, if you sort of take, People leave the company. You know, applications get shut down. Like there's, like you need to shut down that access to actually continuously achieve that kind of least privilege, you know, stance. The other part that I think is really important that has come more recently is the assume breach mentality, right? And assume breach um, is something where you assume the attacker is like they've already clicked on. Like stop, stop trying to prevent. Well, I mean, you, you always still should probably prevent the people from clicking on the bad links, but, but from a security practitioner point of view, assume this has already happened, right? They're already inside, and then what do you have to do? Like back to what I was saying about setting up that maze ahead of time, right, to, to increase that time to target. That's something you have to do if you kind of assume breach, and don't, and don't think, oh, the, a harder shell on my submarine is going to be the way I'm going to, uh, going to survive, right? So that mentality is, I will, I will say is new and a really important part of uh, you know, a zero trust sure. philosophy. Yeah, so you know, this is interesting because, I mean, kind of the old days, I don't know, a decade plus ago, f failure meant you get fired. You know, breach meant you get fired, so we want to talk about it, and then of course that mentality had to change because everybody's getting breached. Um, and this idea of least privilege, so it, in other words, if, if, if someone's not explicitly, or a machine is not explicitly authorized to access an asset, they are not allowed, it's, it's you know, denied. So it's, if, it's like Frank Slootman would say, if there's doubt, there's no doubt. And so is that, is that right? It is, I mean, and if you think about it, back to, back to the disaster versus the breach, um, Imagine they did get into an application. I mean, LAMP stacks will have vulnerabilities from now to the, you know, the yeah. end of time, and people will get in. But what if you got in through a low value as asset? Because these are some of the stories. You got in through a low value asset, and you were sort of contained, and you had access to that low value da data. Let's say you even locked it up, or you stole it all. Like, it's not that important to the, to the customer. That's different than you, when you pivot from that low value asset now into high value assets, where it becomes much more you know, catastrophic for, for, the, for those customers. So that kind of prevention uh, is important. What do you make of this, a um, cu couple things. So we've heard a lot about encrypt everything. Um, uh, it seems like you know, these days, again in the old days, you'd love to encrypt everything, but there was always a performance hit. Um, but we're hearing encrypt everything, encrypt, you know, John asked, asked me the other day, John Furry is like, okay, I'm, we're hearing about encrypting data at rest, what about data in motion? Now you hear about confidential computing and Nitro, and they're actually 
encrypting you know, data in the, in, the, in the flow. What do you make of that whole confidential computing that you know, down at the, the semiconductor level um, that, that they're actually doing things like you know, enclaves and you know, the ARM architecture? How, how much of the problem does that address? How much does it still leave open? Hi, that's a that's a hard question to answer. Well, like you're a CTO, percent, so right? that's why I can ask yeah, you these absolutely. questions. No, no, but <laughs> but, 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 but I, I think I mean, it's the age old, age old adage of you know defense in depth. I think. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I I do think like I do think equivalent to what you know we're kind of doing from the networking point of view to do network segmentation. This is another layer of that compartmentalization, and we'll sort of provide similar similar you know. Um, containment, right, of a breach. And that's really what we're looking for now. That, rather than prevention of the breach, and rather than just detection of the breach, containment of, of, of that breach. Yeah, well, so it's actually a similar philosophy brought to the wider network. Uh, right? Absolutely, and yeah, and it needs, to be, it needs to be brought at all levels. I think that's the, no one level is going to solve the problem. It's, you know, across all those levels is where you have to, you know, what are the organizational implications of, I mean, it feels like the cloud is now becoming a, a, a I don't want to say the first layer of defense, because it is if you're all in the cloud, but it's not if you're, if you're a hybrid, but it's still, it's becoming increasingly a more important layer of defense. Um, and then I feel like the CISO and the development team is like the next layer, maybe audit <laughs> is the third layer of defense. How are you seeing organizations sort of respond to that, the organizational roles changing, the CISO role changing? Oh, those, those are two great questions. There's, well, there's two good questions okay. in there. So, so one is, there's one interesting thing that we are seeing about people, like a lot of our customers are hybrid in their environment, sure. right? They have a cloud, they have an on-prem environment, and these two things need to work together. And in that case, I mean, the the massive compute that you can be doing in the AWS actually increases the attack surface on that hybrid environment. So there's some challenges there. And yes, you're absolutely right, the cloud brings some, some new tools to play to sort of decrease that. But it's an interesting you know, place we see where there's attack surface that occurs between different infrastructure types, between AWS and an on-prem environment. Now, the second part of your question was really around how the developers you know, play, play into this. And, I'm a big proponent of, you know, I mean, security is kind of a team, a team sport. And one of the things that we've done in some of our products is help people, so, you know, we, we know, we all know the developers, like, like they, okay, they know they're part of the security uh, story, right? But they're not security professionals. They don't have all of the tools and all of the experience and you know, all the red teaming you know, time to sort of know where some of their mistakes might be made. So I, I am optimistic they, they do their best, right? But what the security team needs is a way to not just tell them, like slap on the knuckles, like you know, developer, you're doing the wrong thing, but they really need a way to sort of say, okay, yes, you're, you're, you could do better, and here's some concrete ways that you can do better. So a lot of our systems kind of look at data, understand the data, analyze the data, and provide concrete recommendations. And that kind of, there's a virtuous cycle there as long as you, know, you play the team sport, right? It's not a us versus them, it's like how, do we, how can we both win uh, there? So this is a really interesting conversation because the developer all of a sudden is increasingly responsible for security, they got to worry about they're using containers now, they got to worry about container security, they got to worry about the runtime, they got to worry about the platform. And to your point, it's like, okay, this burden is now on them. Not only do they have to be productive and produce awesome code, they got to make sure it's, 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 it's secure. So that role is changing. So, you know, are they up for the task? I mean, I, I, I got to believe that a lot of developers are like, oh, you know, something else I have to worry about. So how are, your customers resolving that. I, I, so, I think they're up for the task. I think what is needed, though, is a CISO and a security team, again, who knows it's a, it's a team sport, because, because, so, we, we talk, like, some technology is adopted from the top down, like the CIO can say, here's what we're doing, and then everybody has to do it. Some technology is adopted from the bottom up, right? It's where this individual team says, oh, we're using this thing and we're using these tools. Oh yeah, we're using containers and we're using this flavor of containers and you know, this other group you know, uses these you know, lambda, lambda services, so on. And the security team has to react because they, they can't mandate, they have to sort of work with, the, with those teams. So 
I see the best groups of people is where you have a, you know, security teams who know they have to enable the developers and the developers who actually want to work with the security team. So it's, a, it's the right kind of person, um, the right kind of CISO, right kind of security teams. It doesn't treat it as adversarial. And when it, when it works when they both are, you know, work, work together. And it, that is, I, that, that's where your, your question is where, how, how ingrained is that in, in the industry? That I can't say, but I know that does work and I know that's the direction people are going. Yeah, and I understand it's a, it's a spectrum. Uh, but but I, I hear what you're saying, that is the best practice, the right organizational model. I guess it's cultural. I mean, I, I, it's not like there's some magic tool to make it all that. The, the, the security team and the dev team collaboration tool, or maybe there is, I don't know, but I think the mindset and the culture has to really be the starting well, point. Well, there is, there is a, so I, I always talk about this idea, so however you sort of feel about DevOps and DevSecOps and so on, one core principle I see is really kind of empathy between like the, like the developers and the operations folks or the developers and the security team. And one way I actually, you know, and, and we, we act like this at Illumio, but one way, one thing we do is like you have to, to, to truly have empathy, you kind of have to do somebody else's job, right? Not just like, you know, think about it or talk about it, like do it. So there are places where we, you know, the security team gets embedded deep in the organization, where some of the developers get embedded in the operations work. And that empathy, you know, whether they go back to do what they were doing, that, that what they learned about how the other side yeah, has to work, some of the challenges, you know, what they sort of see is really valuable in sort of building that, building that collaboration. So, so it's not job swapping, but it's embedding is, is maybe how they gain exactly. that. Exactly, and they're, they're not experts in all those things, but they, they but do them take on those some of the responsibilities, be accountable for some of those things. Now, not just do it on the side and just go over somebody's shoulder, but like be accountable for something. Now that's interesting, not yeah. just observational, but actually say, okay, this is on you for no, some No, because that's where you time. feel the pain, that is where you actually <laughs> feel the pain of the other person, which is what, 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 is, what is valuable. And so, that's how you can build one of those cultures, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. you do yeah. need support all the way from the top, right, to be able to do that. For sure, right? and, and of course there are, there, are, there are lightweight versions of that. Maybe it's, you know, if you don't have the stomach for fully, Lena Smart was on this morning, CISO of uh, Mongo, and she was saying she pairs like the security pros that can walk on water mm -hmm. with the, you know, the, the regular, you know, employees, and, and they get to ask all these Columbo questions of the experts, and the experts get to hear it and say, oh, I have to now explain this like I'm explaining it to you know, a 10-year-old, or maybe not a 10-year-old, but a teenager. You know, actually, teenagers are probably well ahead of us, but you know what I'm saying. And, and so that kind of cross-correlation, and then essentially the, the folks that aren't security experts, they absorb enough and they can you know, pass it on throughout the organization. And that's how she was saying, she emphasizes culture building. Yeah. And I will say, I think, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Steve Smith, the CISO of, uh, yeah. of AWS, like, I've heard him talk a number of times, and like, they do that here at AWS. Like, they, do, they, they have some of that spirit, like, and they've built it in, and it's all the way from the top, right? Um, and that's where, if you have security over in a little silo off to the side, you're never going to do that. When the, C, when the CEO supports, uh, you know, the, the security professionals as a, you know, part of the business, that's when you can you, you can you can do the right so thing. So you remember around the time that you and you guys started Illumio, the conversation was you know security must be a board level you know topic, you know yes it it should be is it really you know it, it was becoming that way it wasn't there it clearly is now there's no question about it. No ransomware. Yeah. Now, right, now, right yeah of course. <laughs> let's, let's thank ransomware yeah. Right thank you right uh, maybe that's a, a silver lining. Now the conversation is, is, is around, is it a organizational wide issue? And it, it, it needs to be, it needs to be, but it, but it really isn't you know, fully. You know, not, I mean, how many organizations actually do that type of training? Certainly large organizations do. It's part of the onboarding process. But even small companies are starting to do that now, saying okay, as part of the onboarding process, you got to you know, watch this training video and you know, assure that you've done it. Or, and maybe that's not enough, but it's a start. Well, and I do think that's where, if we get back to zero trust, I mean, zero trust being a philosophy that you can adopt, right? I mean, we apply that kind of least privilege model to everything, and when people know, that people know that, um, 
that this is something we do, right? Um, that, that you only get access to things, because least privileges, you get access to absolutely the things you need to do your job, right? But nothing more, right? And that applies to everybody in the organization. And when people sort of know this is the, is the culture, um, and they sort of you know, work by that, like, you know, that, that it, 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 zero trust being that philosophy sort of helps you know, infuse it into the organization. So, so I think, I, I agree with that, but I think the hard part of that in terms of implementing it for organizations is, you know, organ companies like AWS, they have the tools, the people, the, the practitioners that can bring that to bear. Many organizations don't, so it becomes a, an important prioritization exercise. So they have to say, okay, where do we want to apply that least privilege and apply that technology because we don't have the resources to do it across the entire portfolio. And I'll give you a simple example of where it'll fail, right? So let's say, let's say oh, we're least privileged, right? And so you ask for something to do your job and it takes four weeks for you to get that access. Guess what? Uh, like, yeah, zero trust out the door at that organization. If you don't have, again, the tools, right, to be able to to be able to 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 walk the walk that walk, right? And so it's so it's it's it is something where you can't just say it, right? You do have to you do have to you do have to do it. So I feel like it's a pyramid. It's got to start. I think it's got to be top down. Maybe uh, maybe not. I mean, it's sort of certainly bottom up from the developer mindset. No, no question about that. But in terms of where you start. Okay, whether it's you know financial data or other confidential data, great. We're going to apply that here, and we're not going to necessarily. You know, it's a balance. Where's the risk? Go F, go go hard on those places where there's the biggest risk. Maybe not create organizational friction where there's less risk, and then over time bring that in. Yeah, and I think I think one of the, uh, I'll say one of the failure modes that we sort of have seen around zero trust. If you if you go too big too early, yeah. right? You actually have to find small wins in your organization, and and you you pointed out some good ones. So focused on like if you know where critical assets are, right? That's a good place to sort of start. Um, bringing in like building it into the business as usual. So for example, one thing we recommend is people start in the, you know, developing, you know, zero trust segmentation policy during the development or at least the test phase of rolling out a new application as you sort of work your way into production as opposed to having to retro segment everything. So get it into the culture, um, you know, either high value assets or, or, or work, like, work like that or just pick something small. We've actually seen customers use our software to sort of like Lockdown RDP, like back to ransomware, loves RDP lateral movement. So why can we go everywhere to everywhere with RDP? Well, you need it to sort of solve some problems, but just focus on that one little slice of your environment, one application, and, and lock that down. That's a way to get started, and that sort of attacks the ransomware, ransomware problem. So there's lots of ways, but you, you've got you to gotta, you know, make some demonstrable first steps and build that momentum over time to sort of you know, get to that ultimate end goal. PJ, Lumia has always been a thought leader on, on, in security generally in this topic you know, specifically, so thanks for coming back on theCUBE. It's always great to have you guys. All right, thanks, it's been great. All right, and thank you for watching. Keep it right there. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE's coverage of AWS Reinforce 2022 from Boston. We'll be right back.